Welcome to New Life Live with Stephen Arterburn. For 35 years, New Life has been transforming lives one at a time, thanks to the giving hearts of you, our listeners. Our goal is to provide you with wisdom from God's Word to give you hope and help in life's hardest places. If you have a question you'd like to ask today, our phone lines are open. Call 1-800-229-3000. That number again is 1-800-229-3000. Now here's today's host, Becky Brown. Hello and welcome to New Life. Becky's not quite coming through loud and clear yet, but we will get that fixed. This is Dr. Alice Benton. I'm here with Mark Cameron and Becky Brown will be connecting with us here shortly. So welcome to New Life Live. We are taking calls today. You can call us at 1-800-229-3000. We have a line or two still open, so today is a good day to call. I've been wrestling, Mark, with a topic because we get a lot of calls here on New Life about how should Christian parents respond when their children tell them that they are of the LGBTQ status mm -hmm. and what, what, what should we do with that? And I've heard about research that says if we're not accepting and perhaps even promoting or supportive of our children when they reveal that, we can add to suicidality. And, and actually put their mental health at greater risk. Well, I've heard about the research, but I had never looked into it myself. And that leaves a Christian parent in a confusing position because shouldn't we be presenting God's truth, even if it's opposing our children and who they believe they are, who they believe that they are attracted to? But how do we both protect their mental health while presenting biblical truth? So Preston Sprinkle is a friend of New Life. He's been on the show, and he has a lot of years in the field working with families going through this. And so he breaks down some of that research, and he hmm. has found that it's when parents give a strongly harsh, rejecting response that they add to their children's mental health distress. And suicide does and can become more likely. And so showing our children love and acceptance of at least the fact that this is their experience. We can add in biblical truth, but the briefer we speak about it, the better. The more calm we are in trying to receive that information from our children while offering them support and leading with humility, the better our children will do in the long run. So I was thinking about how much we all struggle with sexual sin and how Jesus responds to it and how God seems to respond to it in the Bible. And when I think about David or the adulterous woman in the New Testament, they both struggled with sexual sin. And God is obviously against sexual sin. He has a protective way he wants us to live out our sexuality, but he does not condemn. He does not condemn. He loves us through it and tries to gently bring us back to the safe guidelines that God has set for us but pretty difficult to do as a Christian parent. And so we just want to give this encouragement that going really strong with love, trying to understand and getting curious about our children's journey while being brief with biblical truth. Mark, I'm curious what you yeah, think. It's, no, I love what you're saying. It's totally true. Um, that message that comes across that we are going to co be contributing to uh, our child's suicidal thoughts is very scary and no parent wants to do that. But I think the truth in what you're saying is really kind of a universal truth of how we need to respond to our kids overall. And there's a difference between tolerance, affirmation and acceptance. Those all maybe they can go together at times, but they all have different definitions and, and we're told um, in our culture that tolerance equals uh, affirmation of somebody's ideas and it, th those two things are not the same and so we affirm our kids in who they are in their identity in our family and that we love them unconditionally even if we disagree on ideas. I love that. I don't know if you guys can hear me but we I'm back. You. We can, Becky. If you can. Okay well I hope that the listeners listen to what you guys were just talking about because it was really powerful. And I hope you'll call us, 1-800-229-3000. We've got some calls on the board, and we're just grateful to have insight like what Alice just presented and what Mark presented. We'll be back in just a minute. Hi, this is Steve Arterman from New Life Live, and Chris Williams and I are doing the Emotional Freedom Workshop. I don't know of anybody that wouldn't benefit 
from emotional freedom. We're all bound or stuck or struggling in some area. What are we going to do there, Chris? Just really help people get clarity around the places where they're stuck in their life. They sort of circle the same mountain of disappointment over and over and over again. You're going to be able to see that mountain clearly and get to a new place of what we call emotional freedom, which is simply I can feel in the world, build a relationship to it, and know what to do with my experiences. The New Life Emotional Freedom Online Intensive is Saturday, March 16th. Steve Arterburn, Chris Williams, and Dr. Jackie Mac Harris will present information on the power of our emotions, procrastination, guilt and shame, and more. And small group leaders will help you process the information you learn. Call 1-800-NEW-LIFE. That's 1-800-639-5433 or register online at newlife.com. To find out more information about New Life or to order any of the resources mentioned on today's program, call 1-800-NEW-LIFE. Now back to New Life Live. Welcome back. Uh, You know, this past weekend, we had our Restore Intensive in Orange County, and we helped a lot of women find freedom and healing in their journey after betrayal. And it's such a powerful time um, to just see the the lights come on, you know, that where they thought that they were lost and there was no hope, they know that there's now hope. And, uh, you know, we want to enjoy, we want to invite you to come and join us in Dallas for Restore in July. And so we also have an alumni group. I led the alumni group. It was just really powerful for to see the group of women who are investing in their lives for healing and to have the life that God intended for them to have. If you want information about that, go to newlife.com or call us 1-800-NEW-LIFE. Right now we're going to go to the calls and we're going to talk with Elizabeth on line one. And she's calling us from Jacksonville, Florida. And she listens on the app. You can listen on the app. You can go to your apps. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks for calling us today. How can we help you? Hi. Um, I was struggling in my walk recently. And my friend, a friend of mine, she encouraged me by telling me that in order to know God more, it really helped her when God revealed to her how much he loved her. And then I was speaking with another friend, and she told me it's good to acknowledge that I love my sin and that I pray to God to hate it. And I, and then later that Sunday in church, my pastor basically tied those two together, and he said, until I understand the gravity of my sinfulness, I will never begin to comprehend the love of God. And I was just inquiring of how can I hate my sin and understand God's love for me and love God more than my sin and walk in the freedom that God has promised us through Christ. Mm. I just want to see God and just behold him and love him and him and delight in him more than my sin. And I've just really struggled with that because I've just fallen really far into sin and particularly like binge eating. It's been really difficult for me and I just can't see. I just want to see the light at the end of the tunnel and walk in God's plan for my life. It's really just hard to do when I don't love him the way I should. I love that you are even thinking about this, Elizabeth, because that's the beginning, right? Is that awareness? Um, Alice, let's start with you. How can we help Elizabeth with this? This is a profound theological and psychological question, Elizabeth. And I think your friend was correct in um, recommending that we acknowledge sin that we're not yet ready to let go of or sin that we get a benefit out of or feel pleasure in, which is most of our sins. It's partly why we we stay (laughs) stuck in them, of course. And then the habit of it is just so difficult to break. And it's by bringing that whole process into relationship, which it sounds like you're already doing, that we start to gain more of a dislike for our sin and, and, and start to want to break away from it. But it takes so much courage to admit, I like my sin. I'm not ready to stop yet. 
But it is that admission that gives God more space to come in and work in our heart and change our heart. Would you tell us, um, have you been able to talk about binge eating in relationship? And if so, what kind of relationship? Professional, structured, or friendships? Not really. I mean, friendships, maybe, but I mean, it's pretty, you don't talk too much about it, just that it's a struggle, and I don't really know how to control it and give it to God effectively. I've recently tried fasting, and I thought, I started out with fasting because I, I, I know you gain a lot of clarity through that, and I thought that would be how I would get to the the light at the end of the tunnel and God would change my habit. But maybe it's really a heart matter and it's not like I'm, I'm trying to do a bunch of things, trying to try a lot of diets, but my doing and my discipline isn't helping me. I know it's a heart change and I don't know how to change my heart. I'm asking God to change my heart, but it turns out like after fasting, it, gets way worse than it ever was before Uh, uh because I guess I'm hungry I don't I just don't know how to control it and what you're describing we we all hit up against eventually that our willpower is insufficient to change many of our sin patterns and so I'm curious what's one of the obstacles that might keep you from getting more structured help and it's often our our embarrassment or gosh I just want to be able to do this on my own I want to conquer this by myself I don't want to bring other people in because this can be tough to talk about, embarrassing to talk about. Does that hold true for you, or is there a different obstacle that holds you back? Structured help? I'm. Uh, well, I did try um, writing out what I'm going to eat for the day, and then trying to stick to that, and that still doesn't work. <laughs> you're, you're employing some good strategies, and an element that might be missing is the relational part. Because it's by having a counselor who has experience in this area and or a group of women who is also struggling with something similar, we gain more power and more self-control when we're understood and loved and accepted as we completely reveal what it is that we're struggling with. So I want you to consider adding that to these good strategies and techniques you're trying. They're not effective enough yet. And I think it's partly because the relational portion is missing. Yeah, I like okay, that, Alice. So- Mark, what would you add to that? Yeah, I agree with what Alice is saying here. The you know, I love your question, Elizabeth. It, these are great strategies, but um, our identity changes in relationship, um, and and it's when we grow in our relationship with God that's how we change our identity and then that leads to then Mm -hmm. the efficacy of the the structural Mm -hmm. changes that we're putting in place if you put in the structural changes without the relationship piece um, you're just relying on willpower and then we get so disheartened when we can't follow through on the willpower and and fasting is a is a great thing to do for discipline but because your struggle is binge eating. It's not just eating something that you don't want over a period of time. It's eating it all at one time. You're, it, I'm afraid that you might be setting yourself up to binge eat when you do fast. And so mm-hmm. um, I agree with what Alice is saying. You, it sounds like you've got some good structural changes um, that you're putting in place, like writing down what you're going to eat. Um, but it's hard to stick to it, I think, because you don't. you're not in a group. And I think getting into a group with others who share the same struggles with you so that you can encourage each other and maybe even hold each other accountable mm-hmm. um, throughout the day might be the catalyst you need to be able to help you with the willpower approach part. Uh, Elizabeth, there's I agree with that. There, there's also usually some sort of agony or suffering in your mm-hmm. life that you might deal with with this coping mechanism of how you eat. And, and all of us, we cope with our pain in one way or another. Most of us start with an unhealthy form of coping, and then we get stuck in it. And so the story of what we have suffered has to be part of the healing process, because once we release that pain by talking about it in safe relationship, we, we also have an increase in our ability to manage our emotions that can lead us into binge eating or alcohol use or any of our over-the-top behaviors we engage in to feel better when we feel poorly. 
And that's where a therapist yes. who is experienced yes. in this area can help you gain those insights. And right. then even go into a group when other people share, you might find that your story is very, very similar. And so yes. when you when you remove the addiction, really the the, the hole that you're filling is still there. Mm -hmm. And so the right. so the sobriety right. just is, is is allowing you to get to work on the it that is underneath as we that's call right. it when we talk about well music, and matter of right. fact that's what i was just thinking yeah. is um, copy of so have lose it for love groups for people who have attended our um intensive but we'll get you connected with a coach or a counselor too elizabeth that can get you some structured help just like what you're talking about alice and uh, interestingly enough, when Steve starts to talk about Lose It For Life, he begins with, this, with the spiritual piece. And because a lot of times we don't equate that with the same thing. So we're glad that you called and we'll get you started on that journey. We're going to keep going to the calls. We're going to talk with Sharon, who's calling us from Birmingham, Alabama. From She's listening on one place on line two there. And uh, we're glad you called. Sharon, how can we help you today? Well, I'd like to know um, how I should proceed with a relationship with my sister, who is my identical twin. So it doesn't help that I look in the mirror every day and see her. Um, we, look, we live a thousand miles apart, but we were very close and talked every day. She was my father's primary caregiver for the last three years, and he died just after Thanksgiving. He was 100. And um, oh, wow. right after right after the funeral, or I mean before the day of the funeral, I was having a hard time. And well, let's go back up. It's been about a couple of years that it was really hard to talk to her to really have a conversation because no matter what I said, she had already heard it. Um, I was being morbid, um, just different things like that. Or I'd, I'd give her a point of history and she'd say, well, where'd that come from? It was there was no ever any conversation, and that I went up before the funeral to help her do stuff. And no matter what I said, it wasn't right. I got please or uh, uh, or why did you say that? You know, there was just no conversation at all. And the day of the funeral, I struggled all night, and I woke up, and she could tell I was struggling. And I came out and I said, you know, you could really help me. And, and when I said that, she blew up. I mean, Mount Vesuvius couldn't have been any higher. Mm. <laughs> and she, mm. so she went on and on. And um, so we went to the funeral. I sat there feeling like I had been verbally pistol whipped. And after the funeral, I packed up and I left. I didn't say anything to anybody. I just left. And I came home and I cogitated on it and I wrote her a nice letter about three weeks later. I mean, I got things from her saying, what's the matter? How come you kicked me to the curb? And what did I do to hurt you? And I was like, I'm just in flabbergasted that she doesn't understand, doesn't even feel. She called my so, husband and wanted so to know Sharon, what's going on. Yes? I want to make sure that we get to it before we go to a break and then it uh -huh. will start in a minute. But what I, it was, it was distressing all the way around. What's a good question for us to be thinking about? I want to give you time. Well, for that. I've, I've been working on myself. I feel like I've forgiven her, but I really am reluctant to open the door to have a relationship with her. I, um, I feel like you know, we're done as far as having, we're not ever going to have a close relationship like we used to. And um, I'm afraid that if I shut the door, I'll be sorry. But right now, I'd like to shut the door <laughs> on the relationship. Mm. And uh, if she knocks, I'll answer the door and give her what she needs, but I'm not going to open the door. And Sharon, with the letter you wrote describing why you, you took a step back from her, how did she mm -hmm. respond? Was she able to take any responsibility for the blow up? No, no, not at all. Did it she was, did she deny um, it, dismiss it? Oh yeah, she dismissed it and said that if I thought if I thought my letter was going to evoke, well, I'm sorry. She said, forget it. It's never going to happen. And this and, irritability from her was this a real change of character at, no, at your dad's passing? No. no, she's been like this for some time. Yeah. Well, anytime there's a really stressful situation she will go off 
and I've seen her do it two or three other times. Um, like when my mom was dying, she went off on my dad, and um, she went off on my mom one time when my mom didn't respond the way she thought she should, and she went off on so, me years ago. So, um, so she does. So Sharon, she you're trying to get some. So Sharon, you're trying to get some resolution to how do we go forward? Is right. this going to be a distant type of relationship? Or, you know, can you feel pain with this as well? We're, you can hear the music. That's why I wanted to get your question. I knew that Alice would have another question for, you know, just to clarify. Because, you know, when you have big situations like this that involve grief and your sister's caretaking, as well as the history of some short responses, it's it all boils down to how do we have a conversation with someone who's in react reactive mode and there's lots of reasons why people are in reaction but it doesn't feel good when you're on the receiving end we'll be right back after this about four years ago is when i discovered my husband's addiction i heard about new life it has been life-changing for me and for my husband both it was direction when we were lost and it was hope when we had none the help that we received from New Life uh, has been multifaceted. My husband did the Every Man's Battle Workshop. We did the Marriage Weekend. We are avid listeners of the radio and TV programs. And I think those are awesome, wonderful resources. And, you know, I think the people who support New Life financially are people that I'll never know. You know, I'll never be able to thank them personally for the gift that they gave to us. I believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that their giving saved me my husband and our family from being torn apart. To make your tax-deductible gift, visit newlife.com and click Donate. Call 1-800-NEW-LIFE or text NLM to 28950. That's NLM to 28950. I've been listening to New Life for many years. I've gone to a few workshops. I want to support a ministry that helps people connect with God and with others and gives them the tools to help transform their lives. You can help New Life Live stay on the air by joining Club New Life today. When you sign up to support us monthly through Club New Life, we'll send you the new member thank you gift of all eight 100-day devotionals, including 100 days of healing, 100 days from freedom from shame, and 100 days of freedom from anger. There are also ongoing benefits like the monthly Club New Life CD or download, access to the Club New Life video library, quarterly resources, free shipping on purchased resources, discounts on workshops, and quarterly online meetings with Steve. Call 1-800-NEW-LIFE. Support Club New Life and together we can help hurting people find help and hope in life's hardest places. Call 1-800-639-5433 to join Club New Life today. We'd love to hear from you. If you have a question or a comment, call toll-free 1-800-229-3000. Now back to New Life Live. New Life Live, we are still taking calls, and you can call us at 1-800-229-3000. But we have been talking to Sharon. Sharon, you described the situation of your sister blowing up multiple times throughout your life, and you're uncertain how much distance you need to take from her. Right. Yeah. So Sharon, this sounds like it, it's a relational pattern that's recurring between you and your sister. It sounds like the latest event for the relational pattern is the the passing of your father and the blow up that occurred at uh, at the funeral. And this is the, a challenging one, you know, as Becky was saying, because you're both grieving and grief is just a very strong um, emotion. It's a, it's a set of emotions that are happening, uh, and and some of it is anger, and and it and it has to do with loss. And and I think there's you you guys are probably grieving differently. I wonder, because you mentioned that she lives a thousand miles apart, and she was the caregiver of your dad, and so she mm -hmm. was likely it sounds like with your dad every day, um, oh, yeah. for however many years, or, or or especially the last moments of his life, and so she's grieving his loss in a different way. And I think when it comes to repairing your relationship, it, you have to find some kind of common ground with the other person. 
And so the common ground for you both is that you're both grieving. But I think it would be a recognition that she may be grieving in a different way than you. Now, having said that, I recognize that it is a relational pattern that's happening for you guys. But I think before you can get to the relational pattern, you probably would need to do some repair and connection over the latest um, rupture that's happened. Um, and I want to speak a little bit here to what you said about you wanting to close the door right now and just let her come after you. I wonder if you have a, a vacillator attachment. A vacillator attachment occurs when we have intermittent connection with our caregiver growing up. And what happens is we, we end up doing this push-pull when we get to adulthood. We want to push people away even though we want them to come after us. And vacillators tend to use a strategy called detachment when they get hurt from somebody and they push them away because they think if, if I don't care about you, if you're away from me, then it won't hurt anymore. But it's not really what they want. They do want the other person to come after them. And so I wonder if that's what you're experiencing right now. And, and I think it's helpful at times to have a word for what is happening so you can understand what's going on. Um, but the detachment usually is not what the vacillator wants. And so ultimately they end up feeling um, unsatisfied in that. And so I, I wonder if just even you recognizing what's going on for yourself can help you maybe put that aside to reach out to your sister who's hurting, who has reached out to you um, in that letter um, because she's feeling a disconnection here. What do you think about what I'm saying? Um, I don't totally agree with that. I see some credence to it, but um, she didn't reach out to me. Well, she did reach out to me first, but it was like an well, what in the world did I possibly do? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? What did you do? And um, so, so, yeah, there is detachment. I, I'm, yeah. I'm like, I just like to, like to be over with. Yeah, and so what I'm suggesting to you is maybe just to recognize with your sister that you guys are grieving differently and that she's experiencing a different type of loss in this moment than you might be experiencing because she was the caretaker of your dad. Oh, yeah, and she, she lost a lot because mm -hmm. she was his caregiver, and by losing him, she lost her home. Mm. And, wow. Oh. oh, her life has been turned yeah. upside down, her father, her work, and her home. And, yeah, and, all, and all of that grief and distress, it doesn't justify how she has treated you multiple times. And so you have the right to pull back, especially as she's not acknowledging what she does. She's denying it and she's minimizing it. But I think your caution is also right to not entirely cut off this relationship. She's your sister. There are times that you have really good interactions. But you can decide and you might tell her, I feel really stung by what happened. And the fact that we can't really talk about it very well together, you, you kind of brush it off, sister. It, it leaves me feeling unstable in our relationship. And so I feel like I got to pull back a bit. We, we can still chat, maybe just about some surface level things, but I can't be quite as available as I used to because I'm still feeling stung. Now, I, I want to come back. I want to be in better relationship with you. But for now, I need a little distance. I, I well, wonder, too. Definitely. Well, I wonder, too, Alice, along that same line, I'm wondering if Sharon is could work with a counselor sister. Like, um, just process what's happening. You broke up, so I didn't hear what you said. I think Becky was suggesting, would, would you consider both talking with a counselor, Sharon, to help you to, to figure out your attachment style and how you might improve how you respond to your sister? but perhaps also inviting your sister into a counseling session that a third party might be able to help you to talk this through even more. Well, I am in, in with counseling right now, and I realize there's a lot of things I could have handled differently, and I've read some things on your website that have really helped a lot. And that's the other thing. I realize I did a lot of things incorrectly, which I could do better now, um, definitely going forward. So. Yeah, and, and I love that. And sometimes it starts with repairing our side of the street. It starts by recognizing what we did wrong. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we're taking on blame for the entire thing. We're just kind of cleaning up um, where where we've not done the right thing here. So I love your, I love your heart 
um, to want to resolve this with your sister. And I think we'll send you a copy of How We Love because mm -hmm. I think that will have a lot of insight for you here. But we're going to a break, still taking calls. Looking forward to speaking to our next caller here on the other side. For most of my life, I've been dealing with an opiate addiction. Why is opioid addiction quickly becoming one of our nation's biggest killers? Maybe it's because it isn't only those who are addicted who are in denial. We did what I see so many parents do, is it can't be an addiction. There's something medically wrong. It's impossible to solve a problem when you don't know what you're up against, and families will try to find any explanation except the one that will put them on the right path. Alcoholism and drug addiction is a family disease. It doesn't affect just the individual. If someone you love is abusing painkillers, know what you're up against. It's time to admit it's addiction and seek treatment. Call us today at 1-800-NEW-LIFE. We have Christ-centered partner treatment centers around the country. Call 1-800-639-5433 or visit us online at newlife.com. We just made a decision. We will do whatever it takes. 1-800-NEW-LIFE. Daniel Grossman on coaching. Coaches are really focused on the future and helping people to develop those skills and those strategies to help them move forward in their life. A coach really partners with you to focus on things like personal growth or health goals, spiritual growth, helping you develop in your career or possibly strengthening your relationships or maybe even breaking free from a negative pattern. If you need a coach for life, your career, relationships, your health and fitness, leadership and more, call New Life today and ask about the New Life Coaching Network. Our coaches have been trained and screened with the same intensive process we use for our network counselors. Coaches use different techniques. Some like to use strategic questions and accountability ultimately empowering you to take those next steps towards your goals. Take control of your life and take action to achieve your goals. Call 1-800-NEW-LIFE and talk to us about getting a new life coach today. I really believe that everyone can use a coach in their corner. 1-800-NEW-LIFE. We're glad you joined us for New Life Live. To be a part of the program, call 1-800-229-3000. Now back to New Life Live. Welcome back. I want to remind our listeners about our life recovery today, because in that program, we're able to delve deeper into the topics that we touch on briefly here with our calls. And so please check out liferecoverytoday.net and you'll be able to see all of our past episodes there as well and learn more about the topics we talk about here on the show. We're gonna go back to the calls. And Cora, we wanna welcome you to the show. You're calling from Allentown, Pennsylvania on WBYN. Cora, how can we help you? Hey Cora, are you there? We will try again a little bit later. Let's move over to Mary on line one. Mary, I, you're Mary calling from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, WFIL. How can we help you, Mary? I think we lost Mary here. Let me try Cora. Well, we will get this figured out and we will come back to you, ladies. Oh, I think Cora, we have you on. Hi, can you there hear you me? Are. Yes, we can hear you. All right, we got it figured out. Welcome to the show, Cora. How can we help you? Yeah, I'll uh, say what my question is, and then I'll just give a little background. Um, how do my husband and I talk to my uh, in-laws who were, like, over-the-top spiritual? And the background is they're in their 80s. My mother-in-law was actually born in a foreign country because her parents were missionaries. Um, they were missionaries. My father-in-law was a pastor. They live on a retirement center that's just, like, for their uh, mission agency, and they pretty much just want to talk about, like, what are you doing for the Lord? What are the prayer requests? So how can we not enable that behavior and, like, be respectful and kind? Is there anything we could do or say? And tell us about how much contact you're in with them. How often do you spend time with them? Well, um, we, they're not in good health, so I haven't seen them in, like, three or four years because they live pretty far from us. My husband saw them on Thanksgiving, so I rarely talk to them because, I'm going to be honest, I find it incredibly annoying. Um, so my husband talks to them maybe every other month um, and sees them maybe once a year. 
And their conversational style is irritating to him also? Uh, somewhat, but he's like a pleaser and like a pastor's son. And so, he, you know, codependent, he doesn't want to upset him and start like trouble. And as I'm curious that you're calling with this question as you speak to them so infrequently, do you wish you were able to talk with them more, that you had more tolerance and capacity and could guide the conversation better to be able to speak with them more often? Um, I don't really want to speak to them more often, but I guess I feel guilty as a uh-huh, Christian. Sure. Like, you know, like, and, and then I thought my husband and I were actually traveling somewhere yesterday and we were listening to a podcast where somebody called in and I think it was uh, Sherry said how over spiritual she sounded her kids wouldn't talk to her and you know I I said my husband see see I mean I I like it was very validating because I was like I knew there was something not right like are there other people out there besides my in-laws so I was going to have them listen to this podcast um but um yeah I just thought I would call and is there any area you have been able to connect with them in a decent way apart from spirituality any other topic no, no. Mm-mm. So, Corey, your concern is that every time you're having a conversation, they're just asking you about what they can pray for you about, or they're talking about the Lord? Yeah, something about, like about the church, like, what are you mm-hmm. doing in the church? What are mm-hmm. the kids doing? Um, yeah, so I, I guess for me, I want to be like a better Christian, and mm-hmm. I don't know any other way other than to avoid them and not talk to them much, because I feel, I do, I feel like I'm enabling them, like, like, you know, when they're, like, just talking about God all the time, you know, and if I'm trying to think um, of a a situation where I'm trying to think, there's so many things they don't know about what's going on with Mm -hmm. their grandchildren and stuff, like really crazy things that would probably kill them if they, especially my father-in-law, if he literally knew what was Mm -hmm. going on. And I just was thinking, well, maybe there's a better way to help them, or be, should I just be like old dog, new tricks? Just you know, be polite, you know, tell them I'm praying for them. Cora, um, I, I'm just, cu- I'm curious what you're referring to. What's one crazy thing that's going on that they would not want to know about with the grandchildren? Um, uh, I, I hesitate to say. Um, has to do with, let's just say, very strong pornography, mm. perhaps prostitution, shall we say? Oh. Wow. Yeah, so now I see what you're saying is that you do have other topics that you could talk to them mm-hmm. about, but you are afraid that they just won't have tolerance to be able to hear yeah, those. And I'm not saying we should bring that up to them. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not saying that. That's like a crazy topic, you know? Right, but there's real stuff that's going on in, in your life. I mean, we are conditioned... Um, in our society when somebody says how are you doing to say I'm fine even though we may not be fine because that's often what we think is the socially acceptable answer that the other person wants to hear and it takes a lot of vulnerability to be able to say to somebody well actually this is what's going on in my day I'm kind of so so right now Um, but I think what you're saying here is that the hesitation is you're not sure what their response is going to be and if their response is going to be attuned or supportive to um to what you may share with them, even if it's something that's not quite so um, shocking to them. Um, But I I would say here, because you're stuck between, do I just not talk to them uh, frequently? Uh, And then when I do, do I just not share um, really what's going on and just kind of communicate on this, uh, um, you know, superficial level? I would challenge you that uh, to just kind of talk about the dynamic. And if you're afraid of their response with some of the things that you're going to say, maybe maybe that's the thing that you talk about. And you say, hey, there's some things that I would like to share with you guys, but I'm concerned that they may be difficult for you to hear. Um, but I do want you to know what's happening in our family. Um, would it be possible for me to share something that could be a little bit difficult for you to hear and you just to listen to it out? What do you think they might say if you said that to them? Um, well, I don't think it would be good all around because my father-in-law, um, prides himself on the great prayer warrior he is, but he worries like crazy. Uh, He would say that too. You know what I mean? So I think that, um, that would just make things worse. Like if, if so, I think, I mean, right now I just think, yeah, I just don't think they could handle it. 
Mm-hmm. So, Cora, yeah, the facility that they're in, he has a lot of health conditions, and they, well, he thinks he does, and they think he should go for counseling, and he won't go. And, and you know, there's nurses there and stuff, and they think it's all in his head because he doesn't, you know, because he keeps so much bottled up inside. So I feel like I would almost be adding to his physical condition mm-hmm. because, in my opinion, he doesn't do what he needs to do to help process what real life is like. So I don't want to add to his stress. Cora, your your hesitation makes sense. I'm also an avoidant person. And so I would much rather not call when there are so many uncomfortable factors in having conversations with your in-laws. And yet your guilt is nudging you that just avoidance is not the healthiest approach. And there's something more, something different to be done. Now, I, I agree that adding in some little bits of truth in any small doable amount will likely address your guilt that you're feeling and even if it's just would you would you pray for what for one of the kids they're just having a tough time lately just just going through a little rough patch without revealing more but admitting we could use your prayers i would appreciate your prayers but i think to be able to get there there are a couple of other steps i'd recommend you take i want you to keep confessing your avoidance to people in your life who love you and whom you trust because it's by the admission of the avoidance that we start to be able to get the strength to move past the avoidance and i'm with you in that because i struggle with the same characteristic but it's not right for us to stay stuck in it so keep admitting it and ask for prayer from the people who love you to get past it and to get through it and then i want you to pray particularly for more strength and tolerance to have some capacity to engage with your in-laws Lastly, I want you to pick a bite-sized amount of time, and it might be you have five minutes before the next thing you have to go to, the next appointment, and I want you to purposefully call your in-laws with a topic that you can tolerate, and maybe it's asking them about one of the places that they were missionaries. Maybe it's asking them their reaction to something in the news. Maybe it's just asking them how their day is going, but you're calling as a missionary because you know the conversation is probably not going to be enjoyable, and yet you want to serve your in-laws. And by giving them a little bit of time, a little update about the family, you're offering them a grace. But do it when you have the strength and your time is limited so that you can tolerate it. Try those three steps and let us know how it goes. We'd we'd like to hear back from you about this, and we're going to send you a book. What bookmark do you think would be best? to help Cora. Um. I'm going to say changes that heal. Yeah. Um, Changes That Heal will just give you some more understanding for some of the complications in relationship that you are dealing with. And that's by Henry Cloud. So we'll be sending Changes That Heal Your Way. Uh, Cora, we are so grateful that you called. And uh, we're going to be getting to some other calls when we come back from the break. And folks, as we always recommend a counselor, we have a New Life network of counselors. And you can always call to ask if we have a counselor in your area that we can connect you to to help you through these tough situations. We all face days where life throws us a curveball and our routines or plans get disrupted. Things we wanted to do are forced to take a backseat to the unexpected demands of the day. If you normally listen to New Life Live on a radio station, well, you might not be able to that day. And on these hectic days when you're feeling stressed or frazzled, hearing the sound of counsel given on New Life Live is just what you need to navigate the unexpected things of life. Every time I'm troubled or I have a problem, I'll cut on new life. And there's always, always something that is said that is helpful to me. By listening, I have learned more than I can ever express about how God wants me to live. Download the New Life app for the easiest way to listen wherever you are and at a time that's convenient for you. Or watch the show on our YouTube channel. You can even subscribe to our podcast from your favorite podcast provider. You never have to miss a day of new life. Wherever you are, we are. I was sort of vaguely familiar that the 12 steps had some origination in the Bible. I found life recovery. And one of the things I liked so much was that it had such a broad appeal. It wasn't limited to just alcohol or drugs, that it was addressing a a wide range of problems. At New Life, we believe everyone can benefit from a life recovery experience. There are life recovery groups all over the country. They take place online, in conference calls, and in person. And if there isn't one in your area, we can help you start one. We have startup materials, leader's guides, CDs, Bibles, and more, all with discounts available for groups. Call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE and ask for Terry Ward. 
The 12 Steps have long been a great help to people in recovery because much of the 12 Steps' power comes from the fact that they capture principles clearly revealed in the Bible. The 12 Steps is really a pattern for all of us as Christians. Call 1-800-NEW-LIFE. That's 1-800-639-5433. To find out more information about New Life or to order any of the resources mentioned on today's program, call 1-800-NEW-LIFE. Now back to New Life Live. Welcome back. Folks, just want to remind you that in addition to our radio show, we have so many resources that we can offer you through our call center, whether that's some of our new podcasts that have come out for Every Man's Battle, the books that we have, and that New Life network of counselors that I mentioned. The Emotional Freedom Intensive is also coming up. It's going to be online March 16th, which makes it so accessible wherever you are. And if you register by March 1st, you'll get the early bird rate. So don't miss out on that discount. Uh, we got Mary back. So we're going to try again to talk to Mary from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, calling on WFIL. Hi, Mary. How can we help you? Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. Mm -hmm. Um I have a son uh, who told us about six weeks ago that he is separating from his wife of nine and a half years. And so we were trying to be supportive and, and all of that stuff that you do. Um, it, it, but it came to our attention that he has already has this friend. He was calling her. Um, and now that he's in his own apartment um, with the three-year-old and uh, five-year-old, um, you know, it's come to our attention that he's been hanging out with this new friend and her son. Um, and I just feel that it's inappropriate. This is all so new for these little guys, these little ones, mm -hmm. and they're already acting out. Um, and so I said to him, "Let's. I want to get together with you. And he said, well, Mom, if you're going to, um, you know, tell me your opinion, I want to tell you that I, I'm starting to make my own decisions now in my life, and I... I don't want your opinion. And so I didn't even respond back because I am shocked and I don't know where support, you know, and he said, all I want from you is your support and love. And I don't know how to differentiate between support mm -hmm. and me telling him my, he says opinions, they're concerns of mine. So I just would like some help with that. Mary, what's your relationship like with your daughter-in-law? It's actually okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we had told them they, we really didn't think that they should get married mm -hmm. um, when this all went down, but they did. And my son, when he told us of the divorce, of the separation coming up, he said, I wish I would have listened to you. Mm -hmm. But And she's a little goofy, but you know what? I, I mean, if they'd gone to marriage counseling, I'm sure they could have worked it out. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but, you know, I would be hopeful that they would. But my son, and she is willing to go. Uh, my son says, no, it's too late. Um, it's over. And um, Yeah, know. so you saw some red flags and, and you tried to give some ad, uh, advice, but that was nine years ago. And now they've been married nine right. years ago. And in every marriage, there are challenges, there are difficulties, but your daughter-in-law is willing to go to counseling and now they have kids. Um, but it sounds like your son-in-law's checked out. Um, and he's yes. jumped into a new relationship. And so I like your question, though, about operationally defining what does support mean? And mm -hmm. I think that's maybe a good question for your son to say, hey, you're asking me to support you. What do you mean by support? And then he'll give you his definition. And then you can let him know what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. And you can say, I'm willing to do this, but I can't do this other thing. And... To a certain degree, if somebody doesn't want to hear our voice and hear our opinions, that is up to them. And so we don't want to force our voice or force our opinions on them. But if we do have a concern, we do want to try our best to be able to speak our concern to them. But if he has no tolerance for that, then um, you may have to um, put that on the back burner but that may limit then some other things that, that you might do for him. So, for instance, if he wants you to watch the kids while he and this new friend go out on a date, then an example of boundary would be, I'm not willing to do that in this moment. 
correct. And he has wanted our family mm-hmm. to meet her. Mm-hmm. And my other one other son had said, no, absolutely not, no. you know. Um, but but then I, I, I struggle with wanting to just mm-hmm. shake him mm-hmm. and just say, are you crazy? Like, how can you do this to these kids? They can't mm-hmm. handle this yet. They um so I just I just don't know how to even have a relationship with him. You know, I I love him dearly, but I am just so furious. Mm-hmm. Mary, as, as he seems to be saying, the support he wants is for you to not give your opposing opinion about what he's doing. That's such a sticking point for you as a believer, and understandably so, and I think rightly so. Do you think your son is still a believer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What makes you think so? What's the strongest evidence you see of that? Well, I, I think because he was working at, you know, um, well, he's not, they weren't going to church, so they weren't walking, you know, uh, um, with the Lord. But whenever I would bring up about the Lord or I would say that I, you know, I would pray with him or, you know, um, always giving him you know, guidance in that area, and and my husband also, you know, he, um, he was receptive so, to it before. He accepted, he accepted the okay. word when he was a young child, and you know, we have raised them in the church. So, I, so I, Mary, I, I think I that he's a believer. I think that does give you the footing to um, to say your opinion once. So he doesn't want you to, and you may have to let him know, and perhaps even in writing. I will I I will not continue to give my opposing opinion, but I do have to say this once because of our shared faith. I have to point out, I love you. I always will, but I think what you're doing is wrong, and I think it will hurt your children, and it will be difficult for me to have relationship with this friend of yours, especially as you're not even divorced yet from your wife if that is the case. So, give him the truth that you need to say, do it briefly and surround it with love and do it once. And unless God firmly nudges you to do so again, I would not continue to repeat that. And then I want you to decide as well, would that be better coming from your husband or from you? Now, I I think I would be inclined to um, be open to relationship with this other woman down the road because of wanting access to your grandchildren still. And so after stating your stance, I'd prayerfully consider being open to eventually meeting her, maybe not right away, but down the road, because you want to remain an influence and a support and a loving presence for your grandchildren. And with Alice's uh, suggestion here, maybe it's you and your husband go to your son together, because oftentimes there's strength in numbers, and it's harder for somebody to push back on when two significant figures are coming to them. But I think it's also important to understand that and for your son to understand that you are going through a grief yourself. You know, this family is splitting up, but it, it's impacting you and it's in, impacting the whole family. And so this is challenging for you. And, and also, I'm not sure what your son's expectations are about you maintaining a relationship with your daughter-in-law, but she is ultimately the mother of your grandchildren. And so you will need to maintain a relationship with her um, uh for the sake of, of of your grandkids here. And so that may be something that you end up communicating to your son too. And we're going to send you our book, Doing Life with Your Adult Children mm-hmm. by Jim by Burns, because yeah. it's book. all about how to give truth briefly while maintaining relationship. And Mary, we'll be praying for you because this is a very difficult situation. Um, folks, we just want to remind you that Every Man's Battle is coming up on March 1st in Dallas. And so, so there is still time, not a whole lot left, but there is still time to be able to sign up for the Every Man's Battle Intensive. And ladies, if you're the one listening to that, many of our men go because of their wives, because of their wives making the call or their wives asking or requiring of their husbands to come to Every Man's Battle. And so please feel free, ladies, to reach out to us to find out how to go about that. Folks, thank you so much for listening. We will be in prayer for you. We appreciate you tuning in and we will see you next time on New Life Live. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Becky. Just a reminder, we will be on for Thanks another for hour, and so we we'll be this taking program your calls. has helped you by giving you insights for handling the challenges you face in your life. We want you to know that we're here for you, but you also need to know that New Life Live is a listener-supported ministry. 
make your donation or to get any of the resources mentioned on today's program, call 1-800-NEW-LIFE. That's 1-800-639-5433 or write to us at New Life Ministries, P.O. Box 1029, Lake Forest, California, 92609. Please join us again tomorrow for New Life Live. Thanks for watching today. We love helping people. I hope you sense that. And we know that there's always hope if you find the right resource. Now, if something we've said that somebody else applies to you, that's fantastic. That's what we're hoping for. But also, if you want to join us directly, you can call 1-800-229-3000 between 1 and 3 Eastern Time, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Those are the best times to get through. And while you're here on YouTube, Check out these other videos that we've done to help people see where they could grow or a different path to take. And if you do that, would you give us a thumbs up on the video and please subscribe to this channel. There are many ways that we can help you outside of the radio program, and it's very hard for some to pick up a phone and dial 1-800-NEW-LIFE, but when you do, we put you in touch with somebody who cares about you, knows all the resources out there, and they're going to find the best for you. There is no reason to struggle alone. I hope to see you tomorrow. Hope you'll invite somebody else to come and join that maybe needs just a little bit of help along the way. I'll see you next time.